What are the written Gospels? Were they biographies of Jesus? Not really. A Gospel is an ancient Mediterranean in-group document written by and for a Jesus group, and not at all for outsiders. Gospel documents are absolutely unconcerned for outsiders, and not written for them or about them. They were not intended for any missionary purposes, meaning to evangelize outsiders or to proselytize them to become insiders. Gospels are in-group retellings of the well-known story of Jesus, well-known to Jesus group insiders, specifically tweaked for the particular Jesus group in its specific circumstances living decades after the Jesus movement. Gospel documents were occasional documents. What does that mean? They were occasional, meaning they were not written for all people of all times. The Gospels we have, Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John, and other Gospels too that didn't make the canonical cut, were all group maintenance documents. They were written to be read within specific Jesus groups to maintain group loyalty to the God of Israel as revealed in the experience of Jesus. Gospels are documents which are not theological in scope. As Drs. Richard Rohrbaugh and Bruce Molina explain, these documents are not theological in content, purpose, or scope, meaning they are not explicitly concerned with articulating, expressing, unfolding, or explaining God, the nature of God, ideas or definitions of God, as theology usually is. Sure, the Gospels are theological in that they talk about God and they're full of God talk. In that sense, they are theological, but nothing like systematic theology or theological treatise was being written in the Scriptures. That kind of thing really begins with origin for what would later become Christianity in 325 Common Era. First century Mediterranean people, including Israelites, had no explicit religion. Religion was not a discrete institution separate from other institutions in society, back in the days of Jesus and for the subsequent generations of his followers. Rather, people of that time had domestic religion and political religion. Or better, religion existed diffused or embedded in either kinship or politics. The Gospels articulate Jesus' political religion for a decades later audience devoted to a domestic kinship religion, that of Israelite brothers and sisters in Christ. Christ is a political term. Brothers and sisters are kinship terms. In other words, the Gospel stories tell of Jesus' activity within a framework of Israelite politics. Jesus' program was one of proclaiming theocracy, kingdom of sky vault, or wrongly translated, kingdom of heaven, with God as patron. Think the Don in the Godfather trilogy. Jesus acts as broker between the clients, Israelites, and the God of Israel, the patron, and he was crucified as a political agitator. Those being addressed by the Gospel stories were later Jesus' followers who had formed fictive kin groups with a religious agenda articulated in kinship terms. That's why they called themselves brothers and sisters. The stories of Jesus told in the synoptic Gospels of Mark, Matthew, and Luke are essentially meant to be narratives that might make sense of the experience of those hearing the stories. Gospels are directly about making sense of the lives of the in-group hearers, and only indirectly making sense of the life of Jesus. The Gospel narratives have a beginning, and a middle, and an end. And generally, narratives begin with an equilibrium. Articulate a disturbed equilibrium and then seek a restored equilibrium in the end. The presumption is that hearers of the story, various Jesus in-groups, lived in a situation of disturbed equilibrium. The story of Jesus is meant in the end to restore equilibrium to their lives in their ongoing life story. Therefore, the story of a given gospel is meant to carry or support Jesus group members to help them make sense of their experiences. 
It provides them with a fictive kin group religion and offers them social mooring or pegs on which to hang all of their lived experiences. In other words, the Gospels are not directly concerned with making sense of the experience of Jesus, but rather with making sense of the lives of his followers living decades later. The stories of Jesus in the Synoptic Gospels, Mark, Matthew, and Luke, are each, in their own way, focused on what the God of Israel gives to faithful Israelites by means of Jesus, with the help of the Apostles. As a rule, Jesus' opponents are Israelite elites and hostile spirits. The God of Israel overcomes these enemies through Jesus. In other words, the audiences of the Gospel stories, as faithful Israelites, identified with what God did to Israel through Jesus, with what God did for Israel through Jesus. Most specifically, the Gospels were written by and for Third Wave Jesus Group members who wished to know about the First Wave experience that accounted for their own fictive kinship groups. The Gospels tell of what Jesus said and did in a way relevant to third-wave Jesus group members. Second-wave writers, such as Paul, say almost nothing about what Jesus said and did. It's as if he wasn't interested in that. Documents such as the Gospels of Mark and Matthew tell the story of a certain personage located at the origins of some movement group, and these are usually third-wave documents. In other words, from a social scientific point of view, the Gospels of Mark and Matthew, and also Luke-Acts, reflects a well-known third-generation principle. In a situation of radical and irreversible change, grandchildren, third-wavers, wish to remember what children, second-wavers, wish to forget of the experience of first-wave or first-generation parents. Note that Luke-Acts is a fourth-wave document, but this applies to Luke-Acts as well, because Acts concerns Paul, and Acts would be third-wave or third-generation from Paul. First, Divino Afflanti Spiritu, a papal encyclical by Pope Pius XII, issued September 30th, 1943, ushering in a renaissance in how, Bibli how Catholics approach the Bible. Change the world is the Second Vatican Council's dogmatic constitution on divine revelation, called Dei Verbum for short, promulgated by Pope Paul VI, November 18, 1965. The third document is the one we've mentioned earlier, the Pontifical Biblical Commission's instruction concerning the historical truth of the Gospels, issued April 21, 1964, and the Pontifical Biblical Commission's The Interpretation of the Bible in the Church, April 23, 1993. One may access these documents online, on Google, just enter Divino Flanti Spiritu, first thing that comes up right from the Vatican website. Our change of view that is, the change of how big C Catholic Christians see the Bible, though quite recent, is extremely profound. Our appreciation of the biblical text has grown immensely through major changes acknowledged by these four documents, these four official church teaching documents. These magisterial documents explain that the written Gospels contain materials that originated in three distinct first century time periods or stages, often all appearing in the same biblical passage, stage one, stage two, and stage three. Stage one is the ministry of Jesus. These are traditions dating from Jesus' own words and deeds during his ministry in the late 20s, perhaps even the year 29 Common Era. For example, if I'm reading John chapter 9, the story of the healing of a man born blind, there I encounter many things. What in that story derives from stage one? Well, the historical Jesus was known as a folk healer. 
the historical Jesus was known as a folk, folk healer. That would be stage one of gospel evolution or gospel development. Stage two would be the post-resurrectional preaching of the apostles. They experienced Jesus risen by God and communicated to them as cosmic Lord and Messiah, soon to return to inaugurate theocracy, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Skyval in Jerusalem. So convictions about Jesus that arose after his resurrection, especially that he was cosmic Lord and Son of God, that would be stage two. Okay, so let's say I'm reading John chapter 9, the story of the healing of the man born blind. What in that story points to it being from this stage or period? The period of gospel development called stage two. Well, you'll remember that the man born blind after he was healed worships Jesus as if he were a god. As if he were divine. That could not have originated from stage one. Jesus did heal people. He healed blind people. But he never was worshipped by them in stage one. Nobody recognized Jesus as being divine in any way, shape, or form until after the resurrection. So when those details are retrojected back into the, into the story as if that actually happened, this is a clear indication to scholars that this is stage two, not one. Stage three is the most important, most neglected stage. The stage where we have the writings of the Gospels of the Evangelists we call Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John. The texts they produce by those same names are about Jesus, and they were shaped by the situations, concerns, and insights of the Gospel writers themselves, especially by the crises that those communities were undergoing. This takes place after the deaths of the apostles. So what in John chapter 9, the story of the man born blind being healed, derives from this stage? Well, you'll remember that in the story, the man born blind is excommunicated from the synagogue. And his family, the blind man's parents, fear the Judeans who are the authorities of the synagogue, as if the Judeans are a separate group. Because, you know, by the time of the writing of the Gospel we call John, the Judeans were a separate group. The evangelists, my friends, and the church recognizes this officially, did not write the Gospels to give us modern Western biographies and histories, as we use those terms. They wrote for insiders, not outsiders. They wrote for hearers and readers who already were in Christ, and who would ever more embed themselves into Christ, forever coming, quote, to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, John chapter 20, verse 31. That's why they were written. They weren't written to prove unbelievers that Jesus is true. Stop being an unbeliever and come in. They were meant for insiders. Therefore, the Christian faith stage for Christian faith, stage three of gospel development is the most important stage. It gives the evangelist inspired reflections on the meaning of Jesus. And today we're going to focus on these stage three insights of the gospel writers' infancy narratives. What's the meaning of Jesus? You know, Western modern people, when we hear a story, we ask, did it happen? Is that real? Is that factual? Did that happen? Prove it to me. That kind of thing. Ancient believers in the faith from the Mediterranean world, the Middle East, are different. Because different cultures ask different questions, don't they? So people from where the church came, the church didn't come from America, didn't come from the West, didn't come from Northern Europe. The church came from the Mediterranean world, came from the Middle Eastern world. That's where the church comes from in its first 
itineration and expression, the body of Christ, the questions asked by our biblical ancestors in the faith from that world is, what does it mean? When they heard a story, when they heard a story, they asked, what does it mean? They weren't fact obsessed like us. To ask the Gospels historical or stage one questions, did it happen? Did it happen that way? Is to distract from their main purpose. That's not why they were written. But of course, modern American readers pose such questions anyway. Now, they're not illegitimate questions. Did it happen? Did it happen precisely that way? Those are not illegitimate questions, Americans. Your questions are honest. 21st century Western Americans tend to ask that when they hear a story. Did it happen? Because we tend to, we, we are the only culture that's not able to distinguish between truth and fact. Other cultures besides ours have a much richer and broader understanding of truth than we do. Everybody follow me? Okay, so that's the question we ask because for us, truth and facts are synonymous. Ancient Middle Easterners and ancient Mediterraneans ask different questions. They ask, when they hear a story, what does it mean? What does it mean? What is the meaning of what I've just heard or read? When you look at all of the variations in both the sayings of Jesus and the accounts of events in his life, what we do not have, we do not have an eyewitness account. Now that may surprise some of you. We now have names on our Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those names did not appear on those Gospels until the second century. The fact is we don't know who wrote any of them. We know whom the tradition came to associate them with. One of them, Luke, tells us he was not an eyewitness. He tells us he's in the third generation. And he's borrowed what he knows from a lot of different folks and put it together in a story. Um, the, pro the fact of the matter is, we do not have a single eyewitness account. Moreover, we don't have anything written by Jesus himself. Jesus was almost certainly illiterate. That's a little shocking to modern people. But there were no schools in Nazareth. None. And Israel had the lowest percentage of literacy in the entire Roman Empire. One half of one percent. Um, we have later, almost certainly, legendary stories about why Jesus could not read and write. And they seem to be explaining away what was an embarrassment to the elite of the Roman Empire. But Jesus himself didn't write a book. So we have no eyewitness accounts. We do not have a chronology of his life. Mark created the first one. It's one. It's not even one year long. It's one dry season. And Mark probably intended it as, if you will, symbol of what Jesus did every year during the dry season. But how many years did he actually do it? We don't know. In John's account, as I said, it's three years long. Um, but it's so hit and miss and it doesn't correlate very well with Marx that you very quickly get the idea that the chronologies are also theological. They are not historical. These writers are trying to tell you what they believe. They're not doing news reporting. So we don't have a chronology of Jesus' life. We don't have much historical information about his birth. We have no account of his childhood. There's one childhood account in Luke. And it's, it's both interesting and puzzling. Y'all remember the story? He's at the temple with his parents. They all head back to Galilee. He stays behind and he's talking with the elders. Now, if you go, and go to the uh, textbooks for Greco-Roman schools, 
in which students were taught to read and write, um, you will discover something very interesting. Luke, who clearly has a very, very high level Greco-Roman education, by far the best writer of Greek in the New Testament. One of the schoolboy textbooks tells us that if you're going to write a, a story in praise of somebody, you must include one childhood incident. And you ought to pick out an incident that provides an omen for what the adult will eventually become. So Luke does exactly that. Is it a historical event? Almost certainly not. Does it tell you who Luke thinks Jesus is? Absolutely. Um, but that's the only incident we have in the whole childhood of Jesus. Now, a lot of early Christians didn't like that. They wanted more info, so they created other Gospels. We have the infancy Gospel of Thomas, the uh, <coughs> Apocryphon, it's called of James. That means the secret Gospel of James. <laughs> That's, I mean, these are full of stories about Jesus. And they would not appeal to a modern audience, folks. He crushes a bird in his hands and kills it. And then he laughs. And then he lets it go and it comes back to life. And then one of his playmates um, insults him, so he kills him. And then he brings him back to I mean, it's, it's bizarre stuff. But it sort of filled the need for early Christians who said, I would like to know what the heck was going on with this kid when he was young. And I'm not impressed. <laughs>
Paul wrote his seven authentic letters, which make up the earliest New Testament literature, in the 50s Common Era, and he was dead by the mid-60s. Paul traveled widely throughout the Mediterranean and established a number of Jesus groups composed of Hellene, or civilized, Israelite emigres in major urban centers. Shockingly, Paul almost never quotes Jesus. He simply isn't interested in Jesus' sayings or mighty deeds. Importantly for our purpose here, Paul gives no indication that he had ever heard that there were Gospels about Jesus. Could it be that Paul knew about these Gospels, but just chose to ignore them in his letters? This is very unlikely, for several reasons. A major one is discussed in the companion video to this presentation. Gospels are for grandchildren. You should really watch it after this video. So with all this understood, please forget about the Gospels being composed in the months following Jesus' death and resurrection. It was almost certainly decades after. Since the Gospels were likely unknown in the 50s, when Paul was active, our window narrows to no earlier than 60 Common Era. Except for non-scholarly conservative Catholics and other Christians, basically fundamentalists of various stripes, the document we call Mark was likely the first canonical Gospel written, and is a third wave Jesus group composition. But when exactly was Mark written? Was it composed before or after the Judean War with Rome, culminating in the destruction of the Temple Urban Center Jerusalem in 70 Common Era? Likely, Mark was written afterward. Why? Well, look at the comments in Mark chapter 13 about how the temple will be destroyed. Does this indicate that Mark lived after the fact? Maybe. Mark is vague about the temple's destruction. Or it could be that his descriptions of the destruction of Jerusalem were left vague because he's writing from somewhere way outside Palestine and has only heard rumors of what happened there. Matthew and the earliest version of John were third wave documents written after Mark. The final version of John, with its appended chapter 21, was composed after its Jesus group had become an anti-society, sometime around 100 Common Era, in the fourth wave. The document we call Luke also was a fourth wave document. There is no convincing argument that claims John knew about the Synoptic Gospels, Mark, Matthew, and Luke. But Matthew and Luke knew Mark for sure, even if they never read each other's respective texts. Both these synoptic gospels were dependent on Mark for many of their stories, and so they must have been written later, after Mark. How much later? Again, the companion video to this one, The Gospels Are For Grandchildren, helps clarify matters. Additionally, we can say that it is pretty clear that the documents we call Matthew and Luke were written after 70 Common Era. Both of these documents refer to the destruction of Jerusalem. All four canonical Gospels were evidently composed sometime between 70 Common Era and 150 Common Era. Why do so many scholars claim that they were all composed between 70 and 100 Common Era? A mere 30 years. It is because of possible allusions to them found in extra-biblical works like the Didache, written around 100 Common Era. One could also cite the letters of Ignatius of Antioch, but that would assume that Ignatius wrote his letters around 110. There are convincing arguments that the figure known as Ignatius actually lived and wrote decades after this. Short and sweet, there is a great deal of complicated arguing going on even now. One more thing about John. In its final anti-language form, with chapter 21 attached, it certainly appears to be the final gospel written. Could it come from the early 2nd century? Maybe. But many scholars are convinced that the highly edited version of John we have in our Bibles was written sometime in the 90s. 
The reason is because it belongs to an anti-society, reeling in bitterness from the Judean rejection of the gospel, easily located in time, and this gospel does not address later docetic controversies about Jesus, as does Ignatius of Antioch. Thus, this later version of John comes after the Synoptics, but before Ignatius of Antioch. Thus, it was probably written near the close of the first century. Now, all of these are scholarly guesstimations. They're all probability judgments. They are all reasonable, but not exact or precise. Look carefully at the graph on the screen, my friends. Within this graph, you can see from where all New Testament documents originated and when each evolved. How do we know this graph accurately portrays what happened? One way is by considering the principle of third-generation interest, an explanatory device first articulated by the historian Marcus Hansen. Almost a century ago, Hansen wrote, Anyone who has the courage to codify the laws of history must include what can be designated the principle of third-generation interest. The principle is applicable in all fields of historical study. It explains the recurrence of movements that seemingly are dead. It is a factor that should be kept in mind, particularly in literary or cultural history. It makes it possible for the present to know something about the future. The theory is derived from the almost universal phenomenon that what the son wishes to forget, the grandson wishes to remember. The tendency might be illustrated by a hundred examples. On the basis of the works of Hansen, further developed by sociologist Will Herberg, this principle of third generation interest might be described as follows. When a first generation has experienced significant and irreversible change rooted in some appreciable social alteration. In response to this experience change, the second generation seeks to ignore or forget many dimensions of first generation experience. while the third generation seeks to remember and recover what the second generation sought to forget. This is the principle of third generation interest. As Hansen stated, there really are hundreds of examples of this process cross-culturally. Consider European immigrants to the United States at the turn of the 20th century. They permanently settled in, but they were foreigners. They were people who really did not belong in the American mainstream. And they were abused as such. Their language and customs and attitudes set them apart marked them apart. They were treated as foreign to America, as foreigners, as aliens. Now consider their children, who were a second generation, trying to assimilate this second generation was accused by their American classmates or by their peers as being foreigners, as misfits. Meanwhile at home, their parents accused them of acting just like those stupid Americans. Finally, we come to the children of these children. These are third generation people. They are fully enculturated and assimilated as, quote, true, end quote, Americans. 
And more than that, they are very proud of their first-generation immigrant grandparents. So, they stay attached to their foods. And often, to their language. And their music, as well. We see this same process verified again and again. Didn't we see it among the African-American third generation who were removed from slavery and were very interested in and proud of their grandparents' generation? Or look to the Philippines. There we find the third generation Samoreños, whose grandparents emigrated from Samar to Tagalog-speaking Manila. They wanted to know about the language and customs of Samar and the stories of their grandparents. And we can see this pattern in various third-generation African colonized persons. They too are extremely interested in their first-generation ancestors, the ones who broke the bonds of colonials. Or we can see this on display among American and Canadian Jews, grandchildren of survivors of the Holocaust. Their grandparents survived hell. And an attempt to genocidally wipe them off the face of the planet. These grandchildren are therefore rightly proud of their grandparents, their culture, and their identity as are third-generation Palestinians, people who want to know the story of their grandparents prior to the Zionist criminal takeover of their lands. They want to know what their grandparents had to endure under Zionist supremacy and are proud of their grandparents standing in the face of continued Zionist atrocities and attempted genocide. The principle of third-generation interest is what the child wishes to forget, the grandchild wishes to remember. This principle is active in the evolution of the Gospels. It explains why Paul is silent about the sayings of Jesus. It shows us why Mark and Matthew were written by third-wave messianists, or the third generation of followers, since the Jesus movement. It also shows us why Luke-Acts, written in the fourth wave out from Jesus, was composed by someone in the third generation of those affected by Paul and his circle. We've uncovered 503 sayings, all known stories of Jesus' activity. The next thing we had to do is agree on the criteria. How would you make a judgment about whether a saying of Jesus came from the historical Jesus or was later put in his mouth by people trying to speak in the spirit of Jesus? Some of the criteria we agreed on at the beginning proved more useful than others. I don't have time to take you through all 11 of them, but I want to show you a couple of them to give you an idea of the kind of discussion that would occur. So, criteria one, attestation in multiple independent sources. That's just like a newspaper reporter. You got to corroborate the information you get from another source. So we need to talk about independent sources. Well, we have these. Q, Mark, M, L. That's something, stuff in Matthew alone, stuff in Luke alone, John and Thomas. All of them are independent. Now, some of you are aware that the Gospel of Thomas, the later version, the version we have now, is a Gnostic Gospel. But there was clearly an early edition of the Gospel of Thomas that is a contemporary or maybe even earlier than the Gospel of Mark. It contained nothing but sayings of Jesus, no anecdotes, no stories, just Jesus sayings, and so it's on the list of independent sources. So here is an example. In Thomas, give the emperor what belongs to the emperor, give God what belongs to God. 
in Mark, pay with the emperor what belongs to the emperor and God what belongs to God. There you have a Jesus saying in two independent sources that didn't know each other. That doesn't mean it went back to Jesus, but it does mean it went back prior to either of these two. So it gains a little credibility as an actual Jesus saying. The linguistic criterion one is interesting. You know, when you translate from one language to another, you kind of betray the fact that it's a translation. For example, my grandfather's native tongue was German. And uh, when he learned English, his English was kind of Germanized English. So he would say, out in the light. <laughs> okay. Or throw the cow over the fence a bale of hay. <laughs> <laughs> because that's the word order in German. All right? Well, <clears throat> my grandfather's favorite one, by the way, is my off is all. That meant my vacation's over. <laughs> my time off is all over. <laughs> all right. So we have, we have that phenomenon in the New Testament because Jesus spoke Aramaic which is a Semitic dialect similar to, but not exactly like Hebrew, you can tell that when something is phrased in an Aramaic fashion, it, and we read it in the Greek New Testament, it's been translated from Aramaic. Here are examples. He answered and said. Now, if you do that on your freshman English papers, you'll flunk, because it's redundant. But it is exactly the way you say it in Aramaic. And somebody has simply brought it across from Arabic into Greek. And that tells you more than you'd realize. Not only that we had an earlier form of it, but that the earlier form of it had probably been memorized. And hence, people wanted to bring it across accurately. And so they, re they duplicated not only the content, but also the sentence structure. Here's another one. Behold! That's the way they trans translated it in, in the King James Version. We actually have a variant of this in English. The, the kids, the teenagers are always saying, look, I went to the store. And look, that word look is hine in Aramaic. And we translated it, behold, that makes it sound churchy. <laughs> but it's just the word look. He was going down the road one day. Another one, truly, truly I say to you. That was translated in the King James Version. Verily, verily, I say unto you. Now, if that's not churchy sounding, what is? All right? It's just an Aramaic way of saying, pay attention, you idiot. I'm about to tell you the real scoop. <laughs> okay? So, when you look for characteristics and idiosyncratic kinds of things like that, The environmental criterion is an important one. Uh, some things fit the provenance of Jesus. That is, they fit Galilee in the first part of the first century. They don't fit later periods. Or maybe they fit later periods and don't fit earlier. For example, I tell you, you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church. There is no indication anywhere in any other evidence that Jesus had a church in mind. And so that leads scholars to believe this doesn't fit the period of Jesus' lifetime. It's words put in his mouth by somebody later trying to reflect what they understood to be the thought of Jesus. This is an interesting one. More radical sayings are more likely authentic than ones that have been toned down. So, for example, in Matthew, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. In Luke, that becomes forgive us, that should be our, forgive us our sins. That sort of generalizes it. It's not as radical as a peasant saying, damn it, I am in debt and I need help. So that's another one of the criteria. Embarrassment is one. The assumption is that people would not purposely cook up confusing things. 
that would be hard to explain. For example, there's a parable in Luke 16 about the so-called dishonest steward. Well, in Luke, there are four different punchlines after that thing, and none of the four match the same, the, the parable. Scholars conclude that somebody didn't know what the heck Jesus meant, and they were coming up with try number one, two, three, and four. Um, that's indication, by the way, that the parable probably does come from Jesus. But the idiots couldn't figure it out. <laughs> They still put it in because they felt obligated to. And so the probability is, by the way, that, that does come from Jesus. What's going on? Did Jesus say, blessed are you poor? Or did he say instead, blessed are the poor in spirit? Which is it? Dr. Richard Warbaugh explains. So today, we're going to try to show you the depth and scope of the problem. So what we're going to do first is we're going to look at the fact that the sayings of Jesus, as they're reported to us, not only in the Gospels, but in other early Christian literature, vary a great deal. And it's going to raise the question of what Jesus actually said. For example, in Luke, blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, where did that word in spirit come from? Was that Matthew sticking in his own two bits worth? Or did Jesus say this twice and say it two different ways? The meaning is radically different. Moreover, note that yours has changed to theirs. Whoever wrote this, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, is not himself a poor person. He's speaking about some people who are at a distance. Now we have to have a third version of that saying. It's in the Gospel of Thomas. Blessed are the poor, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Note the similarity with Luke. That leads scholars to think the Lucan version is original. And the Matthean version has had the addition that's probably the two bits worth of Matthew, who himself was not poor. Between the time of the Jesus movement and the writings of the Gospels, the sayings of Jesus migrated quite a distance and got recontextualized. This is reflected in their variation as found in different Gospels, none of which contain dictated word-for-word -word accurate renderings of what the historical Jesus actually said. Suffice to say that Matthew and Luke pulled from a common grab bag of Jesus' sayings that had been written down, recorded, and passed along, and that existed before they composed their Gospels, like a document that scholars call Q, evidenced by sharing common sayings missing from their other source, Mark. So, why this difference between Matthew and Luke? Well, the author we call Matthew probably softened the Q saying that both he and Luke shared and took their beatitude from. Matthew was at a distance from the poor, but so was Luke, both being literate, elite scribes who could read and write. They were both far removed from the Galilee of Jesus, past an uncrossable socioeconomic divide. But nevertheless, both of these elite authors grappled to respect the words of the master. And in the Lucan version of the Q saying, we have a rendering probably more honest to the pre paschal Galilean peasant and nothing person, Jesus. But the Gospels are inspired. Yes, what a messy business inspiration is. God works in the mess. Here we go again. Blessed are you that hunger now, for you shall be satisfied. In Luke, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. You noting a pattern here? All right, Matthew is at a distance from the poor. But again, the Gospel of Thomas is closer to the Gospel of Luke. Blessed are the hungry, the belly of whom he desires will be filled. Uh, we also have this phenomenon. It goes on. I, I could show you a hundred examples of this. <laughs> Why does this generation seek a sign? Truly I say to you, no sign shall be given. That's in Mark. 
Everybody agrees Mark was the first gospel written, that Matthew and Luke both had a copy of Mark in front of them when they wrote. And that means that if there's a change, the change is deliberate. Well, what Luke does is this generation is an evil generation. So he sticks a little editorial comment in. You so-and-sos, you evil SOBs, <laughs> all right? No sign shall be given, and he adds, except the sign of Jonah. Now that could be a fairly cryptic comment. And so when Matthew tries it, he has to use an explanatory addition. Now the generation's evil and adulterous. You're getting worse by the week here, folks. <laughs> no sign but the sign of Jonah, for as Jonah is three days in the belly of the whale, the Son of Man will be three days, three nights in the heart of the earth. So for Matthew's congregation, explanation was required that apparently was not required for the audience of Luke. So what you're beginning to see is that early users of the text are throwing in editorial additions, they're adding comments, they're explaining, and the say sayings are growing. So let's look at Mark. It's a story about they bring a paralytic four men, they remove the roof above him, they let him down on the pallet in which the, the uh, paralytic lay. Now when it says they removed the roof, that makes perfect sense in a Palestinian context. They built the roofs by putting branches and then mud over top. All right, you could dig your way down through that. They bring him on a pallet. A pa the pallet being talked about is a mat that was rolled up in the daytime and put in the corner of the room, spread out at night, and the poor people slept on pallets. Note what happens when we go to Matthew. They brought him lying on his bed. Another indication that Matthew is not writing to poor people, nor is he among the poor himself. He's talking about audiences that have beds peasants did not have beds. So when you move the story to a new context, the vocabulary begins to change. Noted in Luke, Luke also has bed, but he has something very interesting. They went up on the roof and let him down with his bed through the tiles. There are no tile roofs in Judea or the Galilee. We are now in a Greco-Roman city. And Luke's never heard about digging mud, you know, through the mud of a roof. And the only roofs he knows anything about are tiles. So notice that the context in which the story is being told is again beginning to change the vocabulary. So that's another problem we have. Folks, we have been exploring the sayings of Jesus found in the Gospels and in other ancient writings. Sayings attributed to Jesus with Dr. Richard Rohrbach, Context Group Biblical Scholar. How do we know what Jesus really said? Did he say all of the statements attributed to him? Here we've got one in Matthew, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. In the Oxyrhynchus papyrus found in Egypt, where there are two, they are not without God. Where there is one alone, I say, I am with him. Raise the stone, you'll find me. Split the wood, and there I am. It's somewhat similar. Topic's roughly the same. We get to the Gospel of Thomas. Jesus, I'm the light over all things. I'm all for me, all came forth. Split a piece of wood, I'm there. Lift a stone, you will find me there. Now, is what I have in red here, is that a saying from the actual historical Jesus? If it is, why is it no, no other uh, Gospels that we know of? And why does the Oxyrhynchus papyrus associate it with a comment about two or three? Well, again, it raises the question, folks, we don't know which of those came from the actual Jesus and which of those are commentary by early users of the Jesus saying. <clears throat> Here's another one. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. That's in the Gospel of Matthew. In another early Gospel, I have come to destroy sacrifices, which is, of course, what the law requires. If you don't stop making sacrifices, the wrath of God will not leave you. 
Those two are 180 degrees opposite. Which one did Jesus actually say? By the way, the gospel of the Ebionites was a gospel for very, very poor people. Who, by the way, couldn't afford sacrifices. If you've got one lamb, are you going to sacrifice it? Forget it. Then we've got the gospel of the Egyptians. I've come to destroy the works of the female. What? <laughs> by the way, what he's referring to is giving birth. And we have Christians in the world today who follow that. The Shakers. Right? Did Jesus say it? Here's another one. This is the so-called golden rule. And what you hate, do not do to anyone. You understand that's the negative form of it. In Matthew, we have it in the positive form. What you wish people would do, do to them. In the Didache, an early Christian writing from about the year 125, it reverts back to the negative form. Did Jesus say it in both? In one? Did he borrow it? Did he cook it up? We don't know. And how the heck would you decide? Jesus spoke in parables. They're at a wedding banquet. And he tells this story about a guy invites a whole lot of rich guys and people and they don't come. So he goes out and he invites all the scruffy types. All right. Conclusion. Many are called, few are chosen. Same story in Luke. Now where it's no longer a wedding, it's just a dinner. And uh, at this dinner, he invites many. They don't come. The poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame come. Conclusion. I tell you, none of those invited will taste my dinner. What I'm getting at is, same parable, totally different conclusions. And I know I've said this before. That's exactly what preachers do. They tell Jesus stories, and sometimes the conclusions they come up with are the damnedest things you ever heard. But early Christian preachers did that. We happen to have another version, this one. It's in the Gospel of Thomas. Same story, look at the conclusion. Businessmen and merchants will not enter the places of my father. That guy didn't like businessmen. All right, we, I know preachers like that. So one of the things that's very clear when you look at parables is, the setting in which they are told changes from gospel to gospel. The conclusion drawn by the gospel writer changes from gospel to gospel. Now, did Jesus, did, would any of those three conclusions have been the intent of Jesus? We don't know. And how would you decide? That's not so easy, folks. But it is very difficult to sort out what Jesus actually said from the variant forms of the quotations attributed to him. My friends, in several recent video presentations, we have been exploring with Dr. Richard Rohrbaugh the problem of knowing exactly what Jesus said. There are many difficulties. When we look at the sayings of Jesus as reported by the Gospels, are those exactly what Jesus said? Or were they statements of later Jesus groups writing in the spirit of Jesus? Compounding this problem is the issue of what exactly Jesus did. Now the problem gets even more difficult when we come to the actions of Jesus. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the public career of Jesus is one year long, and John is three years long. Why? Mark produces a chronology of one year. Matthew and Luke follow that chronology, because they follow Mark. John doesn't follow that chronology at all, and I've already shown you how he rearranges things. How long was the public career of Jesus? We don't know. Matthew and Luke have genealogies that are not at all alike. In Matthew, the genealogy has 42 names. In Luke, it has 67. 
and they don't have the same names. In fact, neither one is likely historical. They're there for theological reasons, not historical reasons. Now, John and, uh, and Mark have no genealogy at all. That just speaks volumes to scholars. Try this one. Only Matthew tells of the slaughter of the innocents and the flight to Egypt. You remember that one? Herod's going to kill all the boy babies, so they flee down to Egypt. Does that story sound familiar? But do you remember it told about anybody else? It's told about Moses, right? Does anybody happen to know that it's also told about Sargon the Great? 2,000 years before Moses? It begins to look like that's a stock story in the repertoire of stories of the ancient Near East. And one can haul it out and apply it to anybody if you wish to make a point. Well, Matthew is the only writer in the New Testament who tells us that story. No other early Christian writer mentions it. So you begin to ask, how does it fit Matthew's agenda? Well, it turns out it does. Matthew's trying to present Jesus as the new Moses. So we got to get a Moses story in here. All right? Did that actually happen? No. Theologically, is it true? Yes. Jesus was, for Matthew and his community, the new and greater Moses. And the use of that old story says so. But now we're beginning to surface a problem. How do we know which stories are borrowed or created and which stories actually happen. It ain't so easy to figure that one out either, folks. Mark is the earliest narrative gospel. The other two synoptic gospel authors, Matthew and Luke, depended on Mark. Without Mark, their own narratives about Jesus would be unrecognizable, and probably just not be. Scholars can be sure of this Markan priority due to patterns of agreements in the Synoptic Gospels, Mark, Matthew, and Luke, their shared basic sequence of stories, and the particular ways both Matthew and Luke changed the stuff they got from Mark to write their stories. By this and other scholarly arguments, we can be sure that Mark came first and that Matthew and Luke used Mark as their source. Hence, the Passion Story in Mark is the earliest Gospel form of it we know. As we've explored elsewhere, the Gospels demonstrate third generational interest. In other words, the Gospels were written by third generational people living after the time of Jesus. Consequently, their authors were probably not alive at the time of Jesus' death or when he was first proclaimed risen. They never met the pre paschal Jesus. This raises important questions. According to the Passion story in Mark, every follower Jesus handpicked abandoned him. One follower betrayed him. Another follower denied him. So, no intimate follower of Jesus was present for Jesus' tortures and crucifixion. Decades later, Mark wrote down his Passion report. Ultimately, we must ask, from where did Mark get all this information? Could there have been a pre-Mark and Passion story that existed before the anonymous author called Mark wrote down his story? Surely. Some biblical scholars believe it did and that Mark borrowed from that story. Do we see such an earlier account? Indeed we do, inside our New Testament. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 3 to 8. On your screen, I'd like you to look at that text in red. That's it, folks. That's the earlier Passion story. Those red words, together with the blue, present us with the most ancient traditional element we have as Christians. The Passion story. That's the red. Yes, the resurrection account is also just as old, right there with it. But for the moment, I want you to put that blue line aside. I just want you to focus on the red. Read this earlier Passion story over again very carefully. It's pretty pithy, isn't it? Tell me, do those red lines say anything about Jesus being arrested in a garden? 
Jesus forced to endure an initial status degradation ritual meant to publicly destroy him? Peter's disloyalty? Jesus forced to endure another status degradation ritual before Pontius Pilate and Roman soldiers? Jesus' final degradation being crucified? Jesus being buried with Israelite elites? The historical Paul wrote the document we call 1 Corinthians. He probably composed this letter in Ephesus sometime between August 52 and October 54 in the first century Common Era. But those red and blue words on your screen come from even earlier times. Thus the lines are pre-Pauline, earlier than Paul. Scholars call these lines a pre-Pauline charismatic formula. At Corinth, Paul and the Jesus group had memorized those lines first spoken within 20 years of Jesus' death and resurrection. By comparison, the passion story found in Mark was composed around 70 common era. Get out your Bible and compare 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 3b through 5 with Mark chapter 14 verse 1 through chapter 15 verse 47. Look at that difference. It's colossal. Then consider the tremendous difference in disagreement between the passion story according to Mark and the passion story according to John. The agreement between the Markan Passion and the Johannine Passion is just a mere 15.5%. That's a whopping 84.5% disagreement. Clearly, folks, Mark didn't read John, and John did not read Mark. Unless you are a fundamentalist, you should be able to see that the story of Jesus' Passion grew more complex long before Mark wrote down his Gospel. In fact, there were multiple versions of the evolving story floating around the Mediterranean world before Mark was composed. How else can we explain why Jesus says so much in the Passion accounts of Luke and John than he does in Mark? This is true of the Last Supper scenes also. Jesus barely says anything in Mark, or Matthew who slavishly follows Mark, but Luke explodes with dialogue. His Jesus has so much more to say. And the Last Supper in John? Wow, it is so different. So unlike the synoptics. For John, the Last Supper is a farewell dinner, but it's not a Passover meal. And John entirely omits the institution of the Eucharist. He instead writes about a foot washing that is found nowhere in Mark, Matthew, or Luke. Next come four chapters of dialogue, four chapters between the Johannine Jesus and his innermost circle. What gives? Why these tremendous differences? Folks, looking back at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3b through 5, it becomes evident that both John and Mark embellished and invented many details. From where does all this development come? All of it comes from pietism says context scholar John Pilch. Yeah, some of it was the memory of actual events, many of which were not seen close up. None of the Gospel accounts got recorded with video precision and factual exact accuracy. The evangelists were neither eyewitnesses nor 21st century journalists seeking just the facts. So some of the story is theological fiction meant to convey the more profound truths about Jesus. Invented scenes and details intended to bring out the meaning of Jesus. In any case, the engine that drove the evolution of the passion narratives was pietism. Yes, Jesus existed historically. Yes, he really did die. And he really was crucified. No friend of Jesus had to be present at the cross to eyewitness what happened to Jesus in order to affirm that. And they would have been too embarrassed to invent such a shameful death for Jesus. But what about the details of what happens between his arrest and the disposal of his body? This uppity peasant nothing person from Nazareth was condemned by Pontius Pilate, sure, but did he really have a dialogue with the prefect? Or did Pontius Pilate merely sign an order and have Jesus dragged off? It's okay that things develop and that our Gospels are not 21st century fact-precise biographies. 
Not everything revolves around us and our Western obsessions, Americans. You know, Lent is a good time for metanoia. The world doesn't revolve around us. Despite Scott Hahn and his friends' best efforts, the Catholic Church in official documents acknowledges the evolution of New Testament writings and the Passion story. Everything for the story of Jesus begins with the resurrection. Easter is ground zero for everything else, not Good Friday. Without resurrection appearances, no one would have written anything down other than a footnote about Jesus or his shameful death. In those post-resurrection appearances, Israelites learned that Jesus was raised and exalted by the God of Israel. What else would be needed to empower first century Mediterranean believers, anyway? As Pilch explains, only afterward did interest and concern grow for the events that led up to Jesus' death. My friends, in recent videos we have been learning from Dr. Richard Rohrbaugh, Contest Group Biblical Scholar, specifically about the historicity of Jesus' sayings and doings as found in the Gospels. Now our attention turns to the traditions found in those Gospels about Jesus' resurrection and the post-resurrection appearances. Just how historical were those stories? The resurrection stories that we have differ markedly. Matthew has an angel in the tomb greet the women. In Mark it's a young man. In Luke it's two men in dazzling apparel. Now which was it? Is there a way to know? Matthew, the women run and tell the disciples. In Luke, they do the same, but in Mark, they're afraid and they don't tell anybody. Huh? In Matthew, Jesus himself comes and meets the disciples. Neither Luke nor Mark have that. Matthew's the only one who tells the story of the bribing of the soldiers. It just doesn't exist anywhere else in any early Christian literature. Again, the question is, does that fit Matthew's theological agenda? Since he's writing a theology book, he's not writing a history book. Luke alone has the Emmaus story, where two, two followers of Jesus meet him on the road to Emmaus after the resurrection, and <coughs> they don't know who he is. And it, he, they invite him to dinner, and it says, and in the breaking of bread, their eyes were opened and rec they recognized him. That's not a historical event, folks. It's a sacramental story. It's talking about sharing the, the bread and the wine and having your eyes open and recognizing who Jesus is. Now, when you know that ancient writers told stories as a means of getting across ideas, and they didn't tell stories to report to you the news of the day, again, it raises the question, how do we know what is historical and what is not? Uh, Luke alone has the curious... This is really curious. In Luke, Jesus walks away into oblivion from Bethany. He goes from around the Mount of Olives from Jerusalem to Bethany. He waves goodbye to the disciples and he's gone. That's it. <laughs> What's that about? Um, the resurrection appearance stories differ. In Matthew, all of them are in Galilee. In Luke, all are in Jerusalem and environs. Mark doesn't have any. In John, one is in Jerusalem and one is in Galilee. Again, what, is it, what do we take out of that that's historical? Now, when you know that ancient writers told stories as a means of getting across ideas, and they didn't tell stories to report to you the news of the day. Again, it raises the question, how do we know what is historical and what is not? Now, this list just absolutely blows my mind. This is, the Gospel of John does not have a single one of these things in it. Does not have the temptation, the wilderness, rejection, and that's not a single parable. Virtually every New Testament scholar I know would say to you that if there is anything in the saying of, sayings of Jesus that's likely historical, it's the parables. 
There's not a single one in John. The Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes are not in John. The Lord's Prayer is not in John. All these stories, Peter's Confession, the Transfiguration. I mean, there's some really good stories there. Now, what does that mean? Does it mean John didn't know them, never heard them? Or does it mean he knew them and decided not to use them? John does tell us in his gospel, right at the end, he said, there are many other things Jesus said and did that are not written in this book. That suggests that he knew more than he wrote down. But come on, you don't put in the Lord's Prayer? This is even more amazing. These are in John and John alone. The prologue on in the beginning was the word, all of that. Uh, the wedding in Cana. Nicodemus story. This guy coming to Jesus at night and asking all these. This dialogue goes on. The story of the woman at the well. Now, what's the matter? They didn't know that story? Or did they know it again and choose not to use it? Uh, all the I am sayings, I am the bread of life, I am the door, I am the resurrection and the life. All of those I am sayings that are in the Gospel of John, nowhere else in early Christian literature. Nowhere. So did Jesus say any of those, or are those the creation of early pre Christian preachers? using Jesus' stories. Difficult to tell. It gets much more difficult. Remember the story of the woman caught in the act of adultery? That one is especially interesting. It's in the Gospel of John now. It almost certainly was not in the original Gospel of John. And it's in no other early Christian writing, and it's a great story. And when you look in the Gospel of John, it's very obvious that it's been inserted into the text because it breaks up the tr train of thought. So it's been rather clumsily inserted. And you can hypothesize that somebody read John and said, Come on, bird brain! You can't leave that one out! It's too good a story! And stuck it in. Does that mean it's not from the historical Jesus? It may well be from the historical Jesus. And somebody thought it was too good a story to leave out and so inserted it awkwardly in the Gospel of John. But nowhere else in all of early Christian literature. I am the light of the world. They don't know that. I am the good shepherd. Uh, none of this. This is the bombshell. No other early Christian writing tells the story of the raising of Lazarus. Now think about that, folks. If that actually occurred as a historical event, can you imagine that word wouldn't spread like wildfire? And so why is it not in any other gospel? Not only the four in the New Testament, it's nowhere else in early Christian writing. Maybe it's a theological creation, not a historical event. And again, we got to try to figure out how are we going to tell the difference. Foot washing at the Last Supper. That one's puzzling too. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it's about the sharing of bread and wine, right? They don't do that in John. It's a foot washing. We've sort of dumped the John version, and we follow the Matthew, Mark, and Luke versions. Does that mean John didn't know about the sharing of bread and wine? Does it mean that Matthew, Mark, and Luke never heard of the foot washing thing? The Pope, the new Pope, bless his heart. He did, did you all see the news story about him washing the feet of a woman? And the Italian bishops were scandalized. Good for him. But that doesn't appear in any other gospel. 
uh, this stuff. Not a single one of those stories appears in any other Christian literature. Now, <coughs> you can tell that in trying to sort our way through this, we have to develop some fairly careful criteria by which we will make judgments about what is historical and what is not. We also have to, we also have to come to terms with the fact that some of the history doesn't matter. Whether Jesus was crucified on Thursday or Friday is not a great issue in my life. It might be a great issue whether or not he is the Lamb of God slain for the sins of the world. So theologically that story might have great meaning to me. Historically it has none whatsoever. So one of the things that we have to do is we have to try to sort out what's historical and what's not, but also what's important that it's historical and what's not. Would everybody agree here that the crucifixion, it's important that that's a historical event? Christianity would change fundamentally if that were not a historical event. But the day of the week doesn't matter much. So <clears throat> we got a big sword job and we have to be very, very careful in working out criteria for how we'll make judgments among all these things.